question? Yeah, we good? Yeah. Can you hear me in the back? I think they're good, yeah. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, switching gears a little bit this evening, uh, me and Hamid are here to talk about uh, the philosophy of success and some of the different ways of looking at what does it mean to be successful. Sometimes in the entrepreneurial game, uh, you're, you're constantly feeling like you're in a rat race and, and we thought it would be a great opportunity to speak to Hamid today about uh, uh, some of his perspectives on, on what, what is success, uh, how to achieve success, and to get some of his insights. So I'm quite delighted today to, to have the opportunity to speak with him. Thank you for joining us today, Hamid. Thank um, you. So just to get things kick-started, I'm, I'm interested to know what does success mean to you? First of all, uh, I understand that we're very tight on time, short on time, so we're going to try to make this as quick and as painless as possible for <laughs> everyone here. Now, uh, the definition of success is uh, basically to achieve a certain goal or objective that you have in mind. Mm -hmm. That's the, the Wikipedia definition. Everyone has their own um, imagination or concept of success. So to someone it might be wealth, to someone it might be health. You might find a, a patient and all they want to do is just to survive and to live. You might find someone that's working in the corporate world. Unfortunately, the guys left. I, I would have uh, directed them at, directed <laughs> at them. They want to make billions, and they want to get high returns on, on their investment. So to me, success changed. It evolved over my life. Um, when I was young, I wanted to make 1,000 dinars a month, and I, was, I would be happy with that. And then I wanted to make 2,000 and then I wanted to make three, and the number kept changing. And then I wanted a car, and then I wanted two, and then I wanted three, and it never stopped. And that's why the title, the stickiness of success came into play, because your goals keep expanding, and your dreams keep growing. And my definition changed when I got sick. As you know, um, I had cancer about seven or eight years ago. And in that time, my success was to stay alive. I had chemotherapy, I had radiotherapy, I had a box full of medicines, and it was me and my TV and my bed. And that gave me so much time to think. So every day, I was just hanging out with death wondering if I'd see the next day. So all I wanted to really do was to live. And that was success to me. Today, my definition again has changed. I think after fulfilling the basic pyramid of, of life, which is you know security, um, accommodation, food, then you start reaching aspirational goals. Uh, self-fulfillment, giving back to society. Um, my success today is waking up and being happy at the man I see in the mirror mm. and going to sleep easily. Mm. No burdens, no guilt, no worry, and no stress. Mm. And it's always a hard balance to reach still. Mm. Um, as a primate, my brain keeps playing tricks on me. <laughs> All of us. Yeah. So I try to keep things sort of go with the flow yeah. and not really worry about what's coming and what's facing me. Because end of the day, by the way, we're just a tiny blip mm. in the universe and the cosmic time of, what is it, 14 billion years? Yeah. We've existed for 2 million years. We've actually reached enlightenment 10,000 years ago, mm. if you want to be generous, 20,000 years ago. Mm. And my short existence is not really going to mean anything in the, in the cosmic mm. nature of things. So just enjoy the moment, do good, and that's my success mm. for now. So you had a, a pretty significant moment in your life where you used to live your life one way and then something tragic happened through the illness. 
that changed your perspective. Right. What's the advice today that you would have given the older version of yourself, right? Because now you have the, 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 the privilege of hindsight and looking back. Right. For example, there could be an entrepreneur sitting in the audience today working really hard and, 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 and trying to accelerate and grow. What perspective would you add to what he's doing that, that sometimes a tragic event might bring to your attention? And how to avoid waiting for that tragic event? What to do from now to, to maintain perspective always in life? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think I wouldn't change a thing, first of all, mm. from, uh, from what I've done because it brought me exactly to this moment. Mm. And I was always a rebel growing up. I always had, you know, I, I hated going to school. I hated waking up in the morning. I hated listening to my teachers and professors. And I think, to a certain degree, everyone here feels the same. Um, I think the, the, the defining factor of any entrepreneur is determination. Um, and that fighting spirit is what really gives us success. I mean, success in accomplishing missions. Because end of the day, even if you're in a Zen-like state, you need to make money to live, right? So knocking on the door, not giving up is, is essential. What I would have changed about myself was, man, OK, don't work with your friends and family. <laughs> don't borrow money. Um, ignore what people tell you. Listen to the smart people and what they tell you. I mean, there, there's so many things that we could change. But without those lessons, I couldn't be giving lessons myself. Mm. So. I mean, take the punches, but don't be hard on yourself. I think that's the hardest part. That's the most important part. Don't lose sleep over, over things that happen to you, and don't cry over spilt milk. I think that's the most important thing, because it happened. Move on and improve, evolve, adapt, overcome. Mm -hmm. So, so take, taking from some of those messages, you know, there's a big challenge in me, as a, even myself as, a, as an entrepreneur and somebody who's built businesses, right. trying to to find a, a balance between what's the difference between being ambitious and being greedy? You know, where does where the, the healthy line begin and where does the unhealthy line begin? And trying to navigate between those distinctions. What are some of your thoughts on what you think would be healthy ambition and somebody being extremely motivated versus somebody crossing the line and getting to the point where they're just greedy and obsessed and it becomes an, an, a, a negative thing in, in right. one's character? OK, so let me take us back 100,000 years. We were living in a savanna. Humanity was trying to survive and thrive. And we we're trying to feed ourselves, our family, and our tribe. So what were our essentials? Surviving the wild animals, finding food, and not, not dying, basically. And that instinct that we had, that desperation to find food, to find a mate, to, to reproduce, is what made us all get here today. So we have a, a driving force in us biologically to succeed and to thrive and to grow and to protect our own. So that remains in us today. And we we began hoarding. And we didn't realize that there's a certain time when enough is enough. Mm. So what's the difference between having 10 billion and having 1 billion, or having 1 billion and having 100 million? You still have a nice house. Mm -hmm. You still have security. What about the rest of humanity? Mm. So when technology came and you know our, our lives life expectancy incre increased, our technology got better, our communication got better. All of a sudden, there was no more culling of the weak. It wasn't survival of the fittest anymore. It's survival of basically everyone. And everyone expects to survive and thrive and to get paid and, 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 to, and to grow and, 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 and thrive. So what stops someone from being greedy? Nothing. And that's, I think, the line that the new generation or the millennials are crossing over into. I'm surprised at the, at the awareness 
of the new generation environmentally and technologically and uh, so, uh, so, through society, how they actually care about each other and care about the environment. We grow up, whatever, mm. throw your trash in the sea, who cares about a V8 or a V10 engine, throw oil uh, on the ground, and I think luckily technology has given us the awareness to understand the damage that we're doing to the planet and hopefully it's not too late and it's reversible. I don't think it is. I think we have another 10, 20 years to go and it's going gonna, it's gonna to de degenerate pretty bad. But we'll find out, won't we? Yeah. Um, if, if you were to give advice today to somebody who's working on developing a business and trying to make something successful out of their work, but they're trying to, to think to themselves, how much should I be optimizing every day? How much should I be obsessing over my business? How much should I be tracking my competition without burning out, without ending up in a, in a negative state of mind? Where, where is success in that balance? Another good question. Um, I think the bar remains where you set it for yourself. So you can set a high bar, great. Shoot for the stars and you'll hit the moon. But I think it's dangerous to, to have too high of an expectation because when you, when you fall, you get crushed. So I think it's great to have hopes and dreams and aspiration, all of that. But again, it comes back to accepting reality. And there's a, there's a saying in Arabic that we, we spoke about this before. Contentment is a treasure. So I know it's easy to say after I've, I've built myself and, and, and gotten here, but I am content and I'm not trying to, to go above and beyond because you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. So I think more important than the past or the future is today. So if you do it, great. And I feel that if you enjoy what you're doing, you're going to be so much better at doing it. So if you're under pressure, under stress, you don't sleep and you're, and you're dying the whole time, then what's the, whole, what's the point? And it's going to be harder for you to achieve because the pressure takes, takes away that rational thinking that you usually have. If you're enjoying it and enjoying the journey before the destination, I think you're going to reach the destination and you're going to surpass, surpass your, your goals and expectations. How do you feel about um, the impact of social media in the past 10 years, 15 years into our lives? and how intrusive it's become. Is it making it really hard to be able to check out and to actually reach you know, a, a higher form of living, greater enlightenment, uh, having a peace of mind and quietness in your head to be able to reflect and get to that point where only after your tragic situation did, did you get to? Right. Do, you, do you check out? Do you switch off everything and, and have those moments now? What, what would be your advice to the people building businesses today who seem so obsessed with their phones and the moment-to-moment -moment action of their businesses? Well, I, I gotta admit, I'm a victim of uh, social media myself. I mean, when I check my stats, I spend at least an hour and a half on, on, on social media. And I think it's a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because we can reach out to each other. It's a curse because it drains our energy and our time. But more, more importantly, I think if we look at our social media stars, and our celebrities, and you look at what people are interested in, it's pretty tragic. Mm. We celebrate, sorry, stupidity. Mm. We, celebra we celebrate idiocy. We celebrate people with no ideals. I mean, just as an example, the Kardashians. They're the most famous uh, social media celebrities. Uh, Kylie or Kendall or whatever. She's a billionaire before the age of 30. And the, 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 sad, the tragic thing is that people um, did a GoFundMe to give her 100 million when she was at 900 million so she can hit a billion. <laughs> Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Like instead of worrying about the, the poor or the needy, they're like, let's make you know, a Kardashian a billionaire. So what do you say to something like that? Mm -hmm. you know, we celebrate athletes I love athletes and football and all that. But we forget about the brainiacs, we forget about the scientists, we forget about the computer engineers who make everything possible for us. 
So I think out of all parallel universes, I'm kind of in a good one, but I wish I was in a parallel universe that celebrated intellectualism, science, technology more than, you know, what somebody had for breakfast mm -hmm. yesterday. And how do you feel if we take it more on a micro level and bring it into sort of Bahraini society, yeah. um, how do you think Bahrain is doing in terms of, uh, of these points and, and, and how we're developing young people and developing the entrepreneurial ecosystem here in terms of building the right values, focusing on the right things? What's your sort of assessment going into that? Bahrain has a long way to go. We have a lot of uh, obstacles in our educational system. We need to evolve. We need to move away from the traditional thinking. We have other societal issues where people focus again on, on issues that, that drain from our time. Cultural issues, divisive issues, religious issues even, where we could be spending more time, energy, towards enlightening our youth because without giving them the right tools to create and to be independent and, and self-sustainable and to be free in their thoughts, we're never going to get anywhere. I had a small project where I wanted to have the schools have a little uh, booth in one of the schools as a pilot and we, we teach them or we allow them to trade during break for half an hour. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wants to, you know, uh, you know how kids mm -hmm. trade stuff and sell stuff and whatever. Allow them to, to sell for half an hour and just let the school supervise it. If we're shut down so fast, it will make your head spin. Hmm. So what was the reason? The reason was the parents wouldn't be happy that you're taking advantage of their kids. So there's a black market already. Mm -hmm. uh, people are selling e-cigarettes to, to each mm -hmm. other. People mm -hmm. are saying, so at least if you regulate it, it could be monitored, could be interesting. Mm -hmm. So apparently two years ago, there was a general order for no sorts of financial transactions in any of the schools. So that kills entrepreneurship. You can't, you, you can't teach kids to think independently and then tell them you can't, you can't even sell a magazine or, or anything like that in, in class. And a lot of people might get their first experiences of entrepreneurship by trading things or selling things yeah. in their social spheres or in their yes. circles. That yeah. first dinar, yeah. it means everything. Or well, you had to convince somebody of something. Yeah, yeah. When, when, I, I remember my first dinar when I got mm. it. Mm. I couldn't believe that I actually made money. Mm. You know? And that's the feeling that I want to give our youth mm. so that in the future it becomes something normal. Mm. You, know? you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to be an employee. Mm. So it actually brings me to another aspect of of the culture that I wanted to get your opinion on and, and trying to determine what's the, the best path forward for, for materializing success within the context of building your business where in some cultures there's some difficulty, for example, in being direct or, or giving constructive criticism in a direct fashion right. um, which hinders the work because the better, the, the more open the line of communication, the more ability to, you, you have to, to provide criticism, the more quickly you can get to resolution and, 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 and iteration that adjusts accordingly. Right. What are your thoughts on, on the local culture and, and its ability to withstand that constructive criticism? We have a problem in Bahrain and in the Arab world mm -hmm. in general where people don't like saying no mm -hmm. to somebody else. They'd rather leave you hanging and ditch you then tell you, no, I don't like your product, I don't like your idea, I don't want to work with you. And I don't know what it is. It's, it's being embarrassed or it, it's because we're coming from such, um, you know, a, a, a short acceleration from being primitive to being, um, uh, what's the word? Like? Prosperous. Yeah, prosperous or city, city life or whatever. Urban. Urban, right? So we, we came from a, from an island mentality mentality to an urban sort of mentality. So we consider a lot of things to be rude. And when you say when when you bring up a point and you say to somebody, 
you have to be very careful because everybody's connected to everybody else and everybody is friends with, with somebody else. So if you, if you have a problem with someone, it could spread across. But I think the best policy is being blunt, being straight, being uh, forward. And I think I was lucky to have studied outside Bahrain, so I kind of acquired those traits from the US and, and from Europe. Um, but that's also something culture that we definitely need to work on. And how do you deal with it when you are an entrepreneur and you're trying to get something done yeah. and you're bumping up against that and yeah. you're getting into a situation where you feel that somebody might not take kindly to you making sure that you're getting to the bottom of things and right. they don't want that to happen, right? right? So in those situations, how much, how much are you supposed to be diplomatic? How much are you supposed to ensure that you're caring more about the work than, than anybody's feelings? What's the balance there to get the best success rate? When it comes to work, mm. there's no playing around. Mm. You just, if somebody doesn't give me an answer that I want, mm. I just, I, I barge into their office and I get the answer that I need. So for example, I, I just had an application being bounced around from, from ministry to ministry and nobody would take ownership of, of my application and nobody would give me the rejection or, that, or the acceptance that I wanted. So I went from the top and I kept going down, down, down until I found the employee who was specifically responsible for my application. Mm. And I sat with her and I'm like, what's up? Why aren't you giving me what I need? And she said, one, two, three. And I'm like, okay, I'll give you one, two, three. And I got it. Mm. But in the meantime, it, they, they pulled my soul out until they gave me the answer that I wanted. Mm. And I think that's part of being an entrepreneur, I guess. You, you need to keep going at it until you, until you get what you want. Otherwise, if you just wait for somebody to answer you, it's never going to happen. Mm. Which also... You know, you have other dimensions of that. For example, if you have employees and you're working with a, with a team or you're working with a group, um, you know, the, the, the question to be asked is, you know, what's more important, to be liked or to be respected, for example? Yes. Uh, another situation where you might bump up into a conflict between trying to be diplomatic and get along with people versus trying to get to the bottom of things or make sure that the ball is moving in the right direction. Right. What are your thoughts on the difference between being liked versus being respected and which one is more important? Okay. Well, being liked in social circles is obviously important. Mm -hmm. um, it's just part of a hum our human traits. But being liked in business or, t or wanting to be liked in business, I could consider it as a sort of weakness. I think being respected is important mm -hmm. and to a certain degree, possibly even being feared is important. If they don't respect you, they're going to come like, like wolves. They'll eat you up. Um, even though we call ourselves you know, civilized, business world is not civilized. It's a uh, dog eat dog, each man for himself, greed, selfishness. So if you don't fight for that scrap, somebody's going to take it from you. And until we reach enlightenment, or until we reach utopia, and until we reach the part where money really doesn't mean anything. Because by the way, money is a social construct. There's no such thing as money. Do you know that 8% of the global currency is in cash? The other 92% is just in computers? I mean, just think about that. They're just numbers in machines and everybody actually thinks that they have money and there's no such thing as money. And if the system broke down tomorrow and everything disappears, all these social lines that we've created are gone. And another thing I'd love to add is that, I don't know how we, we, we got here, where we respect someone with a lot of money, whether they have brains or not. So we don't evaluate the person. We look at someone, oh, he's rich, oh my God. Okay, then what? You know what I mean? I wish we can reach a level of enlightenment again where we can respect each other as humans and for our thoughts, not for our looks, not for our wealth, not for our connection, not for anything. But we're not going to get there in my lifetime, so, or our lifetime. So I guess we're stuck where we are for now. 
Well, it seems you have an opportunity at least to shape a little small corner of uh, the universe. You started uh, something called the Startup Factory, right. which uh, I'm hoping is going to be a, a place for you to help develop success within the entrepreneurship uh, community here in Bahrain. I hope so. Um, would love to hear a little bit more about that and, and maybe understand a little bit how it's different from some of the others that are currently operating in the country. Okay. Well, we had our opening last night under the patronage of His Excellency Sheikh Hisham bin Abdurrahman. He was gracious enough to, to come over cut the ribbon and meet the entrepreneurs who gave me a little uh, presentation. So having that sort of support from, from our leadership and from our community is, is invaluable. We've identified some talent, uh, five out of 40 applicants so far, who I believe have the potential to, to grow and to export products and services into the rest of the world. And that will be directly under my uh, mentorship and using my personal connections as well. And I think the difference between the startup factory and the other incubators in Bahrain is me. Um, I've built a solid, I don't know, 12 or 13 companies since I started. I've invented a couple of products. I've learned. I think most of the hard lessons, although I learn new lessons every day. I've been beat up, I've been hammered, I've been banged by life. So I'm going to allow them to do the same. <laughs> That's Haya. She's our, our number one in KB. Say hi to Haya, everybody. <laughs> um, I'm going to allow them to get beat up. But when I see a wall or a train coming to hit them, I'm going to warn them to take a right or a left. Other than that, they're, on their own. they're basically on their own. And we'll give them some basic training, bookkeeping, uh, accounting, marketing, team building, product development, uh, distribution, insurance, all that fun stuff. And that's basically the, the startup factory. What are some of the, the big challenges that you see ahead of them uh, in light of the current uh, market conditions, current climate of Bahrain, what are some of the concerns that you have for the startups that you're seeing? I think they're starting in the worst economic times I've ever seen in our country. I'm sure everybody knows that. No cash flow, no business, no confidence, no oil, and uh, we got a few wars all around us. So I feel bad for them, but I'll tell you what, like a, a bacteria, if they make it through this, they're going to evolve into being a super bacteria. And inshallah, they get there. I don't know. I hope so. I hate to, I hate to be pessimistic, but it's the truth. Well, even in the, in the United States, some of the best companies were made during tough times. Right. And I think it's to your point that if you're able to survive during difficult times, yeah. um, you'll do fantastic during good times, yes. right? If you're doing right. reasonably well during good times, that's not necessarily a testament of your so, good business model. Correct. Um, and so, uh, do you have uh, do you have already some folks who've already started with you guys? Uh, we launched yesterday. We're going to do our official signing with everybody on Wednesday, okay. and I really can't wait to get started. Like we we did some IQ tests, yeah. and we have some actual near geniuses, <laughs> and more importantly, every one of our incubies so far has been that determined type, you know, the, the type that, that doesn't give up, that always has an open mentality, a happy mentality. So to me, th there are some qualities that I see. I believe I'm a people person. Mm. I see some qualities that are special, and I can't wait to see what, what they come up with. And so if anybody wants to get involved, or if there are any um, entrepreneurs out there that are interested, what's the best way to get a hold? Well, it's going to start off with an application form mm -hmm. on... Um, we have a website, uh, thestartupfactory.online. And please follow us on thestartupfactory.bh. Anyone that has any questions, please feel free to, to harass Aisha. Where is she? She's here. There she is. Just harass her online, and she'll, she'll, get, in, she'll get back to you. Okay. Um, do we have time for questions? Or? I don't think so. OK, we need to probably wrap it up. Well, thank you so much, Hamid, for joining us this evening. Awesome. It was a delight thank to you. have you. Thank you, everybody. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. Mr. Hamid Fakhro and uh, Mr. Sanam Khatib, thank you so much. Building more connected and inclusive cities is no longer an option. 
Please welcome for this fireside chat Miguel Gamino, Executive Vice President, Global Cities at MasterCard, Civil Technologist and Entrepreneur, along with Ali Murtada, Director of Rio.